unending romance with the medium. Going to the cinema is entertainment for many, but for me it was different. Of course the entertainment element was there to a limited extent, but it was just incidental. After the initial thrill of the flickering images and accompanying sounds, I settled down to something serious. It may seem rather strange, but cinema going to me was more of an obsession, like going to the temple. And watching films on the big screen in a darkened hall was a spiritual experience. It hardly mattered whether the film was a mythological, historical, social, comedy, or thriller. Being a dedicated archivist, I hold the view that every film, good, bad, or indifferent, even Vinod Chopra's films, <laughs> has its place in cinema history. As for value judgments, I would rather leave them to posterity. <laughs> Puritans and critics of cinema may not appreciate my stand. Associating cinema halls with places of worship may sound outrageous to some, but I feel differently. This may be why I took the decision to ask viewers entering the National Film Archive in Pune to, to leave their shoes and chappals outside. Naturally, one expects the same kind of reverence from one's fellow viewers. Pioneer showman J.F. Madan set the ball rolling by setting up the first chain of movie theaters in this country. By the mid-1920s, his company Madan Theaters owned about 170 cinemas all over the country and accounted for nearly half the national box office collections. He named his cinemas movie palaces. Palaces are normally the abodes of royalty, the exclusive domain of the privileged few, the lucky ones. But movie palaces are meant for the common man to take time off from the drudgeries of daily life and escape into a world of fantasy, glamour, and make-believe. Naturally, the menu on the screen has to be in tune with the atmosphere where it is served. So what is being shown and where it is shown complement each other. This historical tradition is a strong point in show business. The illuminated hoardings and banners in front of the theater, the huge entrance, the rows of marble steps, the sliding glass doors, the red carpeted winding staircases leading to the spacious and chandeliered foyer, the air-conditioned auditorium with rows of pushback cushioned seats, every seat a cool retreat, as the management would proudly claim, the decorative murals on the acoustically treated walls, the outsized wall-to-wall -wall cinema scope screen protected by an eye-catching velvet curtain, and last but not least, the spotlessly clean and scented toilets. He obviously didn't visit Gaiety and Galaxy. <laughs> These are the hallmarks of the traditional movie palace. However, <coughs> barring a few exceptions, a majority of these theaters pay scant attention to the most vital aspect, namely the quality of projection in terms of image and sound reproduction and the size of the projected image vis-a-vis -vis the auditorium. This, of course, is, is now um, outdated, but it's important to read what he wrote at that time, because I myself have experienced this, uh, uh, watching movies in theaters which were shot in uh, widescreen and, and projected in the uh, normal format, and at times you could actually see the microphone dangling on top. I even saw the, the tracks in one film, and of course the lights were visible in many. Since the introduction of CinemaScope, every film is projected in widescreen format, irrespective of the original aspect ratio of the picture, with the result that the audience only sees half the frame, with the top and bottom mercilessly slashed, distorting the original composition the cameraman and director have so painstakingly tried to create. And if you have watched a subtitled print at a film festival or a film society screening, you must have noticed the heads of characters being chopped just to enable you to read the subtitles. Even though the lab's punch marks are there at the real ends for the changeover cue, projectionists like to put their own scratch marks. And if every projectionist puts his insignia, you can well imagine what happens to the images after multiple screenings. It is a pity that when crores are being spent in the making and showing of films in fabulous cinema halls, we don't pay enough attention to these basic points for ensuring quality projection and safeguarding expensive prints. The operator in the projection room who can make or mar a film during projection is one of the most neglected and poorly paid technicians we have in this so-called industry. Most of them have been trained on the job with no academic background, 
Theirs is a hazardous job, spending long hours in the heat of the projection cabin, exposing themselves to the fumes emanating from the arc lamp. All those who have anything to do with films should realize the importance of the projectionist and the need to have skilled and properly trained people for the job. I've often wondered why nobody ever thought of recognizing excellence in the field and encouraging new talent by institu instituting an award for the best projectionist. Just as we recognize the contribution of a cameraman, lab technician, makeup artist, actor, or costume designer, the same argument would hold good for recognizing the contribution of the best run cinema house in the country or state in terms of projection quality, upkeep, and maintenance of the auditorium programming and public service. Thank you.